Well, I just want to thank uh, Sharon and Carl first for, uh, for inviting me and for getting a, a conversation going here that I hope will uh, carry on beyond this event. I think it will. I'm Joseph Clark, and I'm a student um, uh, in the PhD program in architecture at uh, Yale. Um, here, the same thing is happening to me that was happening to David earlier, I think, so hopefully we can work around that. Um, and just to note that, the, that my title here is, is different from what's listed in the program. Of all architectural drawings, the plan might seem to be the most disconnected from actual experience. After all, when we look at a building or when we walk through a building, um, what we see might resemble a section or elevation drawing of a building in certain ways, but um, we don't see anything that looks like a plan. And yet, Le Corbusier, writing his manifesto Vers une architecture between the world wars, stated that the great problems of tomorrow, dictated by collective needs, pose the question of the plan anew. For Le Corbusier, it was the plan that first registered the architect's programmatic and formal intentions, and so he described the plan as architecture's generator. From his Villa Savoie outside Paris to later projects such as the Church of Notre Dame du Haut at Ronchamp, his designs are often read as the products of virtual geometrical operations in an ideal coordinate space. And in each case, a well-composed plan determined formal hierarchies that would give rise to a cogent sequence of experiences. Afterwards, sectional qualities could be defined by the extrusion of walls and the placement of curved sculptural figures, but the plan was to form the basis for the construction of a new modern future. Nevertheless, the Phillips Pavilion, which Le Corbusier's office designed for the 1958 World's Fair, does not follow this pattern. It seems in its entirety to be a sculptural volume, and as we'll see, its plan does not establish the design's basic formal order. To be sure, the plan defines the circulation route visitors took through the building, traversing a short entrance corridor, entering a darkened interior to watch an eight-minute montage about the history of human civilization, and exiting out the other side. Yet, in spite of the seemingly straightforward theatricality of this experience, they would have had an unusually hard time getting a clear mental fix on the pavilion's three-dimensional form. The tent-like design consists of nine large hyperbolic paraboloids whose contours seem to shift when seen from different angles. From the front, the design is marked by a tall angled opening on the right, balanced visually by a smaller pointed protrusion leaning in the opposite direction. But a new set of contours unfolds at every vantage point. A view from the side reveals two peaks inclined slightly to the right and an obtuse shape slouching to the left, while the silhouette at the back is a near symmetrical arrangement consisting of a large central triangular portal flanked by two smaller summits. The pavilion's form is not overtly anthropocentric, and its optical fluctuation doesn't immediately present itself as a simple progression of readings for visitors following a choreographed path around the building. To understand what's going on here, I want to examine the aberrant relationship between the Phillips Pavilion's plan and its overall geometric system, one that inverts a typical process of architectural formation. Moreover, while it's not inaccurate to say that the design was influenced by or inspired by music, I agree with the suggestion made yesterday afternoon that we should resist talk of an abstract mystical uh, unity of music and architecture. And so instead, I want to try to pin down exactly what was transferred from a metastasis to the Phillips Pavilion. Finally, because an international exposition sets up a certain symbolic charge for architecture, I want to consider how a formal analysis of this building might complicate our reading of it as a World's Fair pavilion. Now, of course, it's not difficult for us to imagine why the pavilion might be an anomaly in Le Corbusier's oeuvre. As we all know, responsibility for, the, for developing the design rested largely with Yanis Sanakis, who had worked in the office since the late 40s as an engineer and then later as a designer. Zanakis had a sufficiently large role in the pavilion's design that Le Corbusier eventually credited the building jointly to himself and his assistant, a step that he never took on another project. Tracing the precise influence of each designer upon the project is difficult, but we can attempt a rough account. 
In response to the commission by the Phillips Corporation to design a pavilion for the first global exposition following World War II, Le Corbusier envisioned a poème électronique that would combine architecture, music, color, and projected images to provide a multimedia expression of post-war modernity. Modern architecture had claimed world's fairs as its laboratories since, in the 1920s, the architectural historian Siegfried Gideon cited the Eiffel Tower, which had been built for the 1889 Paris Exposition, as a direct precursor to the avant-garde of his own day. In architects' campaign to sell the image of the modern, a World's Fair pavilion was a chance to articulate the place of technological and aesthetic innovations in the sweep of human history. Le Corbusier had already seized two opportunities to design expo pavilions, the Pavillon de l'Esprit Nouveau of 1925 and the Pavillon des Tons Nouveaux of 1937, both in Paris. By the 50s, over 20 years later, his concept of modernity had evolved considerably, but he was still attracted to the rhetorical program of a World's Fair pavilion to bring together past, present, and future in a coherent image or experience. And precisely for this reason, he considered the Phillips Pavilion's architectural structure to be only one component of an artwork whose creation would be delegated to various collaborators. The projections on the pavilion's darkened interior were selected and composed by Le Corbusier and cinematographer Philippe Agostini to tell a history of humanity. They depict primitive artifacts, the effects of war, and the promise of technology reaching a climax in images of Le Corbusier's own urban schemes for Paris, Algiers, and Chandigarh. Accompanying this montage was an eight-minute electronic work by Edgard Verrez, in which samples of instrumental and other sounds were played on hundreds of speakers distributed throughout the interior. Le Corbusier's plan concept for the pavilion accords with his conception of it as fundamentally a container for the spectacle. Likening the building to a stomach, he proposed a simple curved plan with a small entrance corridor, a central space which visitors would occupy during the immersive experience, and an exit out the other side. The scheme was designed to conduct masses of people smoothly in and out, and moreover, these masses were to be thought of as biological flows. According to Le Corbusier's analogy, human subjects became nutrients to be ingested, fermented, and excreted in a relentless process of decomposition. With a plan concept established, Le Corbusier gave Zanaka's primary responsibility for designing the building. And this division of work, I think, helps explain the tension that we'll see in the resulting design between the interior experience of the pavilion and its exterior character. As we know, Zanakis had already been experimenting with the affective possibilities of curved shapes composed of multiple straight lines. Much of his musical work, Metastasis, premiered in 1955 immediately prior to the design of the pavilion, was conceived graphically in a two-dimensional Cartesian space. And of course, this is his familiar drawing of measures 309 to 314, uh, rendering pitch as the y-axis and time as the x-axis. And it depicts numerous uh, glissandi, or smooth slides between pitches, as line segments collectively forming curved webs. Yet if the formal language of the Phillips Pavilion was influenced by metastasis, it did not originate in music. Uh, ruled surfaces, uh, that is, curved surfaces that can be entirely described by straight lines, appeared frequently in European architecture of the 1950s. This is just one example, a building by Felix Candela, also uh, from 1958. So I think it would be a mistake to conclude that a simple visual resemblance between an architectural form and a graphic musical notation means anything in and of itself. Zanakis' eventual design was a cluster of nine hyperbolic paraboloids, which were to be constructed of pre-stressed concrete. Now, if hyperbolic paraboloids are composed entirely of straight lines, how might they follow a plan which is entirely curved? It's a simple geometrical question. Um, but it brings me to a series of three drawings that I want to examine, uh, produced by Zanakis to document the pavilion's formal conception. These images don't depict the pavilion. They just illustrate the construction of a single hyperbolic paraboloid as an example of the geometrical thinking employed in the design. So the first is a paraline view showing two non-coplanar line segments, one above and one below the horizontal plane at elevation 0. So. This is the first one here, A, and this is the second one, B. The segments are projected onto the horizontal and vertical reference planes. Here's a projection of the first one, uh, and there, there's the other projection, and then the projections of the second one here and there. And their midpoints are connected. 
The next drawing is a composite orthographic view showing both top and side views of the two line segments. And this projection is an example of descriptive geometry, a uh, kind of visualization that precisely locates the segments in their ideal three-dimensional coordinate space and enables one to imagine them as seen from any point. Now, architects might be tempted to revert, refer to the views combined here as plan and elevation, but Zanakis labels them horizontal plane and vertical plane, so he's treating them with a degree of mathematical abstraction that's still one step removed from architectural visualization. And then finally, in the last image, uh, which is shown in a different orientation from the first, but it's the same uh, form, the two line segments are connected by additional straight lines to describe a twisted surface in wireframe. And when this surface intersects with the horizontal plane, which Zanakis now identifies as le terrain de l'exposition, it's registered as an inscribed curve, a trace of the hyperbolic paraboloid. What these drawings allow us to imagine is a virtual framework of lines in space serving as the basis for a cluster of paraboloid surfaces that extend below the horizontal ground plane to be sliced off when actualized as the buildable form of the Phillips Pavilion. Xenakis managed to compose the surfaces in such a way that the outline of this slice, in other words, the horizontal section cut through the cluster at ground level, is none other than the original stomach shape, which, crucially, though it was created chronologically prior to the pavilion's three-dimensional system of forms, now appears as an effect of this system rather than its generator. And you can get a sense of this from my reconstructions. So we were just looking at drawings by Zanakis, and then the, the next three images are models that I made. So this is the uh, three-dimensional network of lines, and then here we've put the paraboloid surfaces between them and then they get sliced off by the ground plane. Only three of the pavilion's nine hyperbolic paraboloids are fully above ground. The other six are each sliced off, giving the sense of a form, something like Freud's figure of the conscious mind as but the protruding top of a mostly submerged iceberg. This formal analysis subverts the typical mode of understanding a Le Corbusier building. While the stomach plan is essential in establishing the pavilion's basic circulation pattern, it's simultaneously questioned by a seemingly prior three-dimensional diagram of which it's merely a trace. If this three-dimensional geometry does not develop from the plan, it can't be resolved into discrete section or elevation readings either. The building appears at first to comprise distinct volumes represented by the three peaks, three separate objects, but these turn out to be connected and inseparable. Uh, and in this respect, the pavilion is one of several late projects by Le Corbusier in which distinct curved entities are replaced by partial figures. In his study of the Phillips Pavilion, Mark Tribe notes how dramatically the design's contours shift when it's viewed from different angles, comparing it to work by Naum Gabo and Antoine Pevsner, whose abstract wire sculptures create a sense of movement or unfolding over time as their geometries appear to transform before the viewer's eyes. In a similar way, the form of the Phillips Pavilion cannot be visually comprehended from a static position, but demands movement around it. Through its smoothness, the Phillips Pavilion offers an alternative realization of the Corbusian trope of promenade architecturale, refusing to yield a finite number of distinct perspectival readings, but rather a continuously varying multiplicity of spatial percepts. We might compare it with a typical mode of apperceiving architecture as a series of subjective perspectival snapshots reinforcing one another and cumulatively yielding um, an objective mental understanding of a building. The Phillips Pavilion sets up a different temporal mode, as the Nakas had mused in a different context. In order for anteriority to exist, it is necessary to be able to distinguish entities, which would then make it possible to go from one to the other. A smooth continuum abolishes time, or rather time in a smooth continuum is illegible. Now, it's not surprising to find a composer so concerned about the temporality of affect. But Le Corbusier, too, had recently taken an interest in music as a metaphor for the way architecture is experienced through music. Architecture is, he wrote, the synthesis of form, volume, color, acoustics, and music. Architecture and music are sisters because both arts proportion both time and space. And in fact, the architect's own brother, Albert Genre, was a composer. Yet Le Corbusier's citation of musical structure as a model for the time dependence of modern architecture was naive by the standards of mid-20th century composition. 
He wrote in the Modulor of 1948 that architecture is not a synchronic phenomenon, but a successive one made up of pictures adding themselves one to the other, following each other in time and space like music. Yet around the same time that Le Corbusier was looking to music as a model of successive aesthetic experience, musicologists were beginning to take note of a spatialization of musical form. 18th and 19th century classical music had generally followed what might be termed a narrative temporal schema in which a work began with the introduction of sonic ideas which were gradually developed and in the end resolved. In this matter, it not only occupied time, but also used internal melodic and harmonic progressions to portray directed temporal experience. Beginning with the serial music of the second Viennese school in the 1920s and broadening after the Second World War, there was an interest in new compositional structures in which musical events did not follow from earlier ones in a causal succession. For example, in the 1960s, Georgi Ligeti would look back on Anton Webern's music as having, he said, brought about the projection of the time flow into an imaginary space by means of the interchangeability of temporal directions provoked by the constant reciprocity of the motivic shapes and their retrogrades. In Ligeti's account, Webern's musical structures do not proceed in linear fashion from beginning to end, but rather circle continuously in their illusory space. In other words, music's directed linearity, which Le Corbusier cites as a model for the perception of modern architectural form through movement, is precisely what many contemporary composers were attempting to expunge from their work. Xenakis would be at the forefront of this effort, though at the time he was designing the Phillips Pavilion, he was just coming on the scene as a major composer. Classical music derives its sense of movement from setting up expectations which are either fulfilled or subverted. But in a work like Metastasis, the contiguity we perceive from one instant to the next lacks the sense of causality of a classical progression. The theorist and composer Jonathan Kramer describes Zanakis's music from this period as an example of non-directed linearity, which, he writes, carries us along its continuum, but we do not really know where we are going in each phrase or section until we get there. What Metastasis shares with the Phillips Pavilion is that each is experienced as a journey through a complex, smooth cluster of forms which is objectively static, but seems to shift with the subject's movement. Each rejects cumulative directed progress towards an understanding of the aesthetic object. So, what's the significance of introducing this formal approach to the design of a World's Fair Pavilion? The stated theme of Expo 58 was, a worldview, a new humanism. Its centerpiece was the atomium, a gargantuan model of a metal crystal molecule meant to remind visitors of the peacetime applications of atomic energy. In comparison to works like this, should we read the Phillips Pavilion as a folly, a virtuosic little bauble whose geometrical abstraction allows us to escape briefly from the overt social messages of the surrounding projects? Or perhaps we should regard the pavilion as a symbol of progress. After all, one of the central themes of the atomic exposition was the envisioning of optimistic futures for modern societies through technological advancements. Architectural uses of hyperbolic paraboloids were common in the 50s as emblems of technological progress, and they appeared on other pavilions at the 1958 fair. This is uh, a model of the French pavilion designed by Guillaume Gillet. Certainly, the Phillips Corporation would have had no problem with their pavilions being viewed in this light. But I want to suggest a third reading in which the design's formal system, by questioning the stability of the architectural figure and the ground as datum, sets up a critique of the world's fair around it. The experience of World War II led many artists, composers, and architects to rethink the experience of time in their work and to experiment with alternate ways in which spatial and temporal matrices could be projected onto a perceptual gestalt. For example, Zanakis had studied composition under Olivier Messiaen, who as a French soldier spent time in a German prison where he wrote his quartet for the end of time, in which the war's apocalyptic effects on European civilization are reflected in a musical rendering of eternity. Jonathan Kramer hears music that questions cause and effect sequences, as does that of both Messiaen and Zanakis, as emblematic of a culture disaffected with the ultimate causal succession, progress. And here we might recall that Zanaka's translation of his title as dialectical transformation does suggest a much more complex experience of time. So might the Phillips Pavilion not lend itself to a similar interpretation? 
The building's programmatic design, as defined by its plan, seems to enforce a clear historical directionality. The prescribed route through from entrance to central chamber and out the other side has its narrative counterpart in the montage of the poème électronique, with its teleologically structured story of humanity's development. Yet, the virtual formal history of the pavilion, implied by its geometrical structure, establishes a tension with this linear schema, suggesting that the plan is contingent and resisting straightforward comprehension through successive impressions of the building's exterior. By critiquing the determinism of the plan, the design suggests ambivalence towards an experience of history that can be reduced to a continuous forward-moving succession. Now I want to conclude by asking what it means to interpret architecture based on the spatial and temporal relationships set up by its organization of movement. Consider our metaphorical uses of the concept of movement. Classical music borrows this term to describe sections of a work organized along a temporal axis as steps in a musical narrative. We might also use the term in a political historical sense when we speak, for example, of the civil rights movement. Reinhard Koselleck writes that the concept of movement as a metaphor for social and political change is an unmistakable semantic component of modernity. In the 18th century, through increased contact with foreign societies, Westerners began to think time not as a transcendent container whose flow could be taken for granted, but as imminent in the currents of a world history. This Enlightenment political understanding of time as history first prompted the adoption of spatial terminology to describe one's situation in it. Social movements arose as the basis for political action, just as progress emerged as the defining horizon of future expectation. After World War II, many sought to go beyond the Enlightenment model of Europe as the most advanced of societies to allow the simultaneous temporal realities of the world's diverse peoples to be conceived as a multiplicity without being reduced to a simplistic causal succession. As other post-war architectural projects sought to recuperate modernism through the iconography of social and technological progress, the Phillips Pavilion, through its aesthetic friction between formal conception and experience, suggests an alternative view of modernity in which progress is not subsumed in a deterministic narrative. Thank you.